hundreds of thousands of years. Now that we have sound, let me, let me just begin again for the benefit of everybody in this room. Welcome everybody to the Cato Institute. I'm Ian Vasquez, Vice President for International Studies here. It is easy but wrong to become pessimistic about the state of the world, to think that everything is getting worse. We are, after all, wired uh, to focus on the negative, on the possibility that danger is surrounding us. That's how humanity, after all, has survived for hundreds of thousands of years. And the news cycle emphasizes disasters, catastrophes, misfortunes of all kinds, bad news sells. Uh, politics itself frequently accentuates the negative, helping to shape our perceptions. But the world has changed dramatically in the past 250 years, and the change is a story of tremendous and unprecedented human progress that is ongoing today and in which the facts speak with a single voice. Humanity has never had it so good. We are living longer, healthier, safer lives on an increasingly bountiful planet. By virtually any measure, human well-being has improved notably as evidenced by large increases in lifespan, the collapse of world poverty, the fall in infant mortality rates, the rarity of armed international conflict, the increase in safe drinking water, literacy rates, education, and on and on and on. The gains have been especially pronounced in the developing world in recent decades, and the gap in well-being between the rich and the poor has been closing dramatically. But what if all of this is unsustainable? What if there are too many people consuming too much stuff and we are headed for disaster? Aren't we running out of resources that <clears throat> whose supply, after all, is not physically infinite? The answers that my colleagues Marion Tupi and Gail Pooley give is a resounding no. They do so in their new book, Superabundance, the story of population growth, innovation, and human flourishing on an infinitely bountiful planet. I'm delighted to uh, host this book forum today for what I think is an incredibly important publication, one that breaks new grounds and tells a compelling and uplifting story of humanity. The book is an antidote to Malthusianism, but it is not wide-eyed optimism, nor is it deterministic. It is based on a massive array of empirical data and, and on reason, or as science writer Matt Ridley might say, the book is rationally optimistic. I'm delighted too because the book carries on the tradition of the late great Julian Simon, who uh, was a friend and scholar at the Cato Institute, and who for decades was the lone pioneer of rational optimism, and had a deep understanding of the key role that innovation plays in human progress. Simon pointed out that the data was telling us a story that was starkly at odds with what the pessimists were saying. We will also be hearing from his son, David uh, Simon, who I will introduce later in the program, and I'm delighted that he could join us. Finally, I would like to think that, as in so many areas of human progress, the appreciation of humanity's great advances has itself seen progress. That is, that an increasing number of people, including intellectuals, recognize what a poor guide Malthusianism has been and how impressive have been the gains of humanity in our times. This too is a sign of progress, not least because how we perceive the world matters for politics and for our own well-being. I hope this book helps people to see things in a more realistic light. Before I introduce the authors, I'd like to first introduce Dr. Larry Summers, who will share some thoughts about uh, superabundance. We've invited Professor Summers, not just because he's one of the most important economists in the world, but also because he can be counted on to provide critical comments, some of which we may not agree with, all of which will be useful to us in refining our own thinking on this big issue. Larry Summers is the President Emeritus of Harvard University, where he holds a professorship still. During the past several decades, he's served in a series of senior policy positions, including Vice President of Development Economics and Chief Economist at the World Bank, Director of the National Economic Council for the Obama Administration, and Secretary of the Treasury of the United States from 1999 to 2001. I could go on, but we would rather hear directly from Professor Summers 
uh, Professor Summers, thank you for joining us by Zoom, and welcome back to the Cato Institute. I'm glad to be uh, with you. I wish you had gone on. I was rather enjoying all the nice things that you were saying about me, and I was remembering what Lyndon Johnson had said when he was introduced in a similar way. I wish my parents had been here for that. My father would have appreciated what you said, and my mother would have uh, believed it. I'm flattered and honored by the invitation uh, to participate uh, in uh, this uh, book. I think that uh, I think that Pui and uh, Tupi have written a very, very important uh, book. It is important, I think, in three uh, respects. First, it adds to the growing uh, body of evidence and knowledge uh, that we have documenting that with all the problems, with all the travails, with all that we worry about, humanity does make staggering and immense uh, progress. I remark often uh, to students that all things considered, I would probably rather have the life and the opportunities of a lower income student in, uh, the, United, in the United States uh, in material terms and the life of John D. Rockefeller. The chance of suffering a fatal illness at a young age would be much lower. The range of foods that would be open would be much larger. The extent of the entertainment options available would be much greater. The comfort of being able to live in a room whose temperature was adjusted to suit would be vastly better for that student. The ability to get to a place three or five or six or 10,000 miles away quickly would be immensely larger. The number of things about which that person could learn would be far greater. The freshness, the range of foods that would be available to eat would be substantially more, and the comfort of the available clothing would be substantially uh, greater. And so I think it is immensely important to recognize the kind of progress. And while this is a point that has been made by a number of others, I have rarely, if ever, seen it made as extensively and as thoughtfully and in as many spheres as it is made in this important volume. Second thing that I think is very, very important is uh, the notion of time cost that this book uh, passes. There's something slightly odd about using the notion of time cash, time cost in a Cato Institute publication, since after all, it was Karl Marx <coughs> who put forward a labor theory of value and sought to explain the value of all things based on the extent of labor input uh, that uh, went into uh, them. But I think it is a very powerful way of uh, capturing the kind of progress uh, that we have all observed. The truth is that an hour of labor 
translates into far more in the way of goods that provide necessities or satisfaction, services that provide uh, utility that has been the case at any point in uh, human history. And one doesn't have to believe in GDP figures, one doesn't have to believe in uh, markets, one doesn't have to believe very much in anything in economic science to see what has happened to the time cost of an immense array of goods and services. And that is uh, documented in a very clear uh, way here. And I think it is an important contribution. And I hope that there will be continuing efforts of some kind to construct ongoing time series on a range of time costs for different goods at different times in different places so that one can continue to monitor this extraordinary uh, progress. I think the third thing that is important about uh, this book is the celebration of what are in some sense the greatest forces that have push human well-being uh, forward. Combination of technological and scientific inquiry and the decentralization and economies on information made possible by markets. It's an extraordinary truth that I always stress in teaching students economics. But there's not a single person anywhere on the planet who in an entirely self-sufficient way from their own knowledge would create a ballpoint pen. The ink, the liner, the tip, the packaging, the everything with all the inputs to those things. And yet we go into stores without the slightest hesitation or doubt that we will be able to obtain a ballpoint pen and obtain a ballpoint pen at negligible cost in terms of our effort. That idea that things can happen and progress can be made without central direction and without central plan is a crucial lesson it is perhaps the most important lesson in a different way from evolutionary uh, biology. And it is the most important lesson that comes out of a contemplation of uh, the market uh, economy. Design without overarching designers can achieve extraordinary uh, things. That is not, to me, a case for libertarian uh, viewpoints on uh, all questions, but it is a tribute to what we now understand about uh, the human uh, endeavor. The other book that was published beside this one in uh, the last month that made a huge impression on me was my student Brad DeLong's work, Slouching Towards Utopia, that highlights the dramatic turn that humanity took in 1870 when progress clearly was established in a way that overturned the Malthusian uh, devil. That is something that 
is profoundly important and is profoundly important to recognize whenever it is contemplated that something needs to be directed or to be planned. Now, if I have a difference with our authors, um, it is not in their optimism. It is not in their overall vision. It is not in their rejection of Malthusian ideas. But it is in their libertarian bias. To say that markets and science produce tremendous, incredible outcomes is not to say that those outcomes cannot be made better through collective and planned action. And the great questions of our time in many ways involve what those actions should be, how they should be designed, what the role of incentives uh, should uh, be versus the role of coordination and uh, planning. As an economist, I share the author's bias for decentralization, but I think it is very important to consider each of these issues on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. But we will all engage in that consideration much more wisely for the extraordinary collection of data and the extraordinarily powerful arguments presented in this important volume. I am honored to have been asked to give these uh, opening remarks and I commend this important work to all who wish to understand the human condition and the prospects for its improvement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Summers, for those uh, encouraging uh, words and critical comments. I'm sure that others, parents are also proud of them for, uh, if they heard those <laughs> words uh, today or later. And uh, I'm sure that they also will have something to say about uh, your comments. We'd like to go now to uh, the, the first uh, of the co-authors, my colleague, Marion Tupi, who is a senior fellow here at Cato's Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, and he's also the editor of humanprogress.org, of which this is a, uh, a part uh, of the project. I encourage all of you to go to humanprogress.org to see the whole body of work uh, in that project. He is also the co-author of the annual Simon Abundance Index, along with uh, Gail Tupi. Uh, Marion is, uh, as I say, the co-author of today's book, and he's also the, a co-author of a book that we published uh, two years ago called 10 Global Trends Every Smart Person Should Know, and many others you will find interesting that also documents uh, vast improvements in human well-being. Uh, it is a coffee table book, and I encourage you to buy these two books as a set. His articles have been published in the Financial Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, and other uh, important uh, outlets. He received his PhD in international relations from the University of St. Andrews in Great Britain. Please help me welcome Marion Tupi. Thanks to all of you for coming. Much appreciated. Um, I'm going to get straight to it so that uh, we can hear from uh, our other two speakers and then uh, eventually have a Q&A session. So I want to begin with a short video. The great under-discussed factor in the climate crisis is there are just too many of us and we use too much shit. Climate deniers like to say, there's no population problem, just look out the window of an airplane, something but empty space down there. <laughs> but it's not about space, it's about resources. 
humans are already using 1.7 times the resources the planet can support. In 1900, there were less than 2 billion people on Earth. Now it's approaching 8. We can't just keep going on like this. The world is just too crowded. There are not enough people. I can't emphasize this enough. There are not enough people. Um, and I think one of the biggest risks to civilization is the low birth rate uh, uh, and the rapidly declining birth rate. Uh, it is, it is, and yet so many people, including smart people, think that there are too many people in the world and think that the population is growing out of control. It's completely the opposite. There's scientific consensus that the lives of children are going to be very difficult. And it does lead, I think, young people to have a legitimate question. You know, should, is it okay to still have children? So who is right? The debate over population growth goes back to at least 5th century BC. In ancient China, for example, Confucius theorized that there was an ideal ratio of land to population. When the population grew beyond that ratio, quality of life would diminish and social discord would ensue. Therefore, it was the duty of the government to maintain that ratio by forcing people to immigrate to less populated areas. The Greeks thought that the population should be large enough to be economically self-sufficient, but not so large as to make democratic governance impossible. Plato, for example, advocated in favor of reproductive incentives and immigration if population was too low, and birth control and colonization, or emigration, if the population was too high. Similarly, Aristotle Get there. there we go. Similarly, Aristotle worried that since cultivated land could not be increased as quickly as population could grow, it was necessary to abort or expose, i.e. leave to die, some children. The Anglican prelate Thomas Malthus resuscitated this ancient debate in his very influential essay on the principle of population in 1798. Malthus became fascinated with geometric and arithmetic growth rates. A geometrically growing value increases in proportion to its current value, such as always doubling, so for example, 1, 2, 4, 16. An arithmetic growth rate, in contrast, increases at a constant rate, 1, 2, 3, 4. So he wrote, Population, when unchecked, increases in a geometrical ratio. Subsistence, by contrast, increases only in an arithmetical ratio. A slight acquaintance with numbers will show the immensity of the first power in comparison to the second. As a result of the mismatch uh, between population and resource growth rates, famine would follow, said Malthus. And this debate reached a fever pitch in the second half of the 20th century when populations of many poor countries exploded, thanks primarily to the spread of scientific knowledge and better medical care. Enter the Stanford University biologist Paul Ehrlich and his 1968 bestseller Population Bomb. In that book, Ehrlich wrote, the battle to, feel, to feed all of humanity is over. In the in the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. There we go. On the east coast of the United States, the University of Maryland economist and senior fellow at the Cato Institute, Julian Simon, who is the main hero of our story, did not buy Ehrlich's argument. In 1980, Simon challenged Ehrlich to a $1,000 bet on the inflation-adjusted prices of five metals. If, over the next 10 years, prices rose, Simon would pay Ehrlich. If they fell, Ehrlich would pay Simon. In 1990, Ehrlich mailed Simon a check for $576 as the real price of the five-metal basket of commodities fell by an average of 36%. So how come that Simon won? Ehrlich measured abundance by counting resources, how much wheat we grow, how many barrels of oil we can drill, and how much aluminum we can extract. But that's problematic for many reasons. For example, measuring quantities of wheat does not account for technological breakthroughs, such as GMO, 
which can increase yields, thus leading to bigger harvests on fewer acres of land. Also, measuring quantities does not account for substitutes. Oil-fired power plants, for example, have been largely replaced by gas-powered uh, plants in recent decades. Moreover, quantities do not account for efficiency gains. An aluminum can, for example, weighted three ounces of tin uh, or aluminum in 1959. Today, it weighs less than an ounce. Why? Because capitalists in the pursuit of profit are incentivized to spend less or as little as possible on inputs, thus making outputs cheaper. There are other reasons, but I think you get the picture. Now, Simon understood that it is much better to measure abundance by looking at prices. Rising price of a commodity implies growing scarcity. Falling price of a commodity implies growing abundance. Prices reflect the behavior and expectations of 8 billion people. In a sense, the market is a giant calculator providing just in time best possible estimates regarding what's scarce and what is abundant. But which price are we to use? You are all familiar with the nominal price. That's the one you see in the store every time you go and buy a loaf of bread. But that price frequently changes, sometimes in some countries overnight. To consider the long-term trends, as Simon and Ehrlich did, the real price is better. Real price takes into account inflation. And to figure out whether something got cheaper or more expensive, you simply have to subtract the inflation rate from the nominal price. This is a picture from Germany uh, in the early 1920s during hyperinflation. If you can see that far, it says 1,000 milliarden, which in German means 1,000 billion Deutschmarks, which this loaf of bread particular cost. So, Unfortunately, inflation measures um, uh, like the consumer price index are contested and distrusted, partly uh, because they are produced by the government, which causes inflation in the first place by printing too much money. And there is another problem with nominal and real prices. They do not take into account what is happening to wages. And that's where time prices enter the picture. How many times have you heard an older person say that prices were much lower when he or she were a child. Well, that is absolutely true, but so were the wages. And wages tend to rise at a faster pace than prices because they tend to reflect the increasing productivity of our species. Here is a boy delivering newspapers, and here, imagine, uh, 30 years, here is the same man now reading newspaper in the back of a vehicle. So during our lifetimes, obviously, our wages increase. Not only that, we also become much more productive as a species across time. Here is an example of wheat harvest in Egypt in 3000 BC. And here is something that you may encounter in American Midwest today. So to calculate standards of living, we must account for increasing wages. Time price is calculated by dividing the nominal price of a good or a service by the nominal hourly wage that you're earning at the time of the purchase. That's the time price. Whereas money prices are measured in dollars and cents, time prices are measured in hours and minutes. Simply put, time price tells you how long you have to work to earn enough money to buy something. Time price is the true price because while we buy things with money, we pay for them with time. Time that we could be spending doing other things like traveling, playing sports, or spending time with our friends. So using time prices makes sense for a variety of reasons. First, time prices capture the changes in both prices and wages. They do not rely on uh, GDP deflators or other contentious measures of inflation like the CPI. They do not have to be adjusted for purchasing power parity between countries because an hour of work is the same in the United States and in China. And they work across time. So it is possible to compare standards of living in the United States in 1850 and in 2022. And finally, time is an independent variable that's not influenced by external factors such as human perception or the environment. Time is universal and constant for general purposes. There is the little issue with Einstein's theory of relativity, but we don't have to get into that. And of course, time is equal for everyone, for everyone has only 24 hours in a day. So let's look at a specific example. 
The nominal price or price of bread, this statistic comes from uh, the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, was 50 cents. By 2022, the price of the same loaf of bread, quantity and quantity, quantity and quality, rose to $1.56. So based on that, we could conclude that bread got 212% more expensive. And very often when you open a newspaper, the newspaper will inform you that something has reached a peak price, something never before seen. But that's because they are talking about nominal prices. They have not accounted for inflation. When you account for inflation, you get to the real price. 50 cents in 1980 is equivalent to $1.81 today. And since we know that the price of bread was only $1.56, we can therefore conclude that bread got 13.8% cheaper. Now we go to the time price. Back then, in 1980, bread, as I said, cost 50 cents. But your typical manufacturing worker uh, was paid $6.57 an hour, which means that he or she had to work four minutes in order to buy a loaf of bread. By 2022, the loaf of bread cost $1.56, but in the meantime, hourly wage of our manufacturing worker has increased to $26.87, which means that now he or she have to work only three minutes. And that means that bread actually got 25% cheaper. So remember that as long as income is increasing at a faster pace than prices, you are becoming better off in terms of time. So where does abundance come from? Well, we start with the overall population. The bigger the population, the more likely it is that it will produce an inventor who will change the world for the better. Like the Scottish pastor, Patrick Bell, who in 1828 developed an agricultural reaping machine that made wheat harvesting much easier. Bell's invention was then much improved by market competition over the next 200 years, leading to the modern combine harvester that helps to make supermarket shelves burst with wide varieties of affordable bread. Of course, Large populations are not enough to sustain abundance. China has been the most populous country in the world for at least 2,000 years, yet until recently it was desperately poor. To innovate, people must be allowed to think, speak, publish, associate, and disagree. They must be allowed to save, invest, trade, and profit. In a word, they must be free, or at least freer than they used to be. With that, let me Thank you for your attention and hand it over to Gail, who will actually show you the, or who will show you the actual empirical data from our book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marion. Gail Pooley is an associate professor of business management at Brigham Young University, Hawaii. He has taught economics and statistics at Al Faisal University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia at uh, Brigham Young University, Idaho, and Boise State University and the College of Idaho. He has published widely in such places like Forbes, the Utah Bar Journal, and Quillette, and other places. He is a senior fellow with the Discovery Institute, serves on the board of humanprogress.org, and also serves on the Foundation for Economic Education Faculty Network, and is a scholar with Hawaii's Grassroots Institute. He's also a member of the Mont Pelerin Society, and as I mentioned uh, previously, the co-author of the si annual Simon Mon Abundance Index. Please help me welcome Professor Pooley. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming out today. Uh, it's a great privilege to be back here at Cato. Um, I'm especially honored to be here with David Simon, Julian Simon's son. Uh, I also want to thank Twitter. Um, that's how I met Marion and uh, five, about five years ago, and he has been the perfect collaborator for this adventure of new discovery that we've been on. Uh, Sir David Attenborough, um, many of you know he's the face and voice of many BBC programs, uh, said, anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. I guess that would make me and Marion two mad economists. So um, we're, we're 
pleased that you're here today that we can share with you the madness that we've discovered uh, all around us. In addition to Julian Simon, our, our work is also based on three propositions um, from George Gilder. Wealth is knowledge, uh, wealth is knowledge, growth is learning, and money is time. From these three propositions, we can derive a theorem. The growth of knowledge can be measured with time. Is this thing? There we go. Okay. Um, so this was really the first conceptual step that we made. Uh, we had to move beyond measuring things with money and begin to measure things with time. Now, scarcity is about what we want, and abundance is about what we have. We can never really measure scarcity because we measure it against this infinite want. But we can measure and quantify abundance. Abundance can be measured, and it can be thought of is what is the percentage change in what you get today for the same amount of time yesterday? It's this change in time over time. That's how we can quantify and measure it. Now, one of our astute readers observed that if you can do the same amount in half the time, you're twice as smart. You've doubled your knowledge. Now, with time prices, we can measure abundance both at a personal level, how abundance is affecting each one of us personally, but we can also measure it how it affects us at a population or global level. So let's talk about the uh, personal level first. So instead uh, of using money to measure our standard of living, um, this reveals this, when we go to using time instead of money, it reveals this astonishingly increasing prosperity that we're enjoying. So for the time it took uh, your grandparents in 1956 to earn the money to buy one refrigerator, you can buy 13 today. For the time it took your great-grandparents to earn the money to buy a bicycle 100 years ago, you can buy 22 bicycles today. And for the time it took someone, a blue-collar worker in 1850, to earn the money to buy one pound of sugar, you get 227 pounds today. So we just, uh, we've, we started looking at these products and we extended our analysis to look at hundreds of different products and services, some going back to 1850, in 18 different data sets. So in the book, we're analyzing these 18 different data sets of things from commodities to consumer goods to cosmetic surgeries. So the first thing that we did is we applied it uh, to this data set. It's 50 basic commodities that are tracked by the World Bank had good data going back to 1980. So we looked at this. This uh, data set includes energy items, food, materials, metals, and um, minerals. So you've got this broad range. I think if I wanted to go to a, a deserted island and have stuff, I'd like to have these 50 things to go with me. So the other uh, advantage of this is these commodities have really not changed. I mean, a, a, a bushel of wheat's kind of a bushel of wheat today. It's been pretty much the same. So when we looked at those, what did we discover? Well, a banana in 1980, what it cost you to buy a banana in 1980, you can get almost three bananas today for that price. The, the price to buy a pound of coffee in 1980, you get almost seven pounds today. So from 1980 to uh, 20, <clears throat> 2018, these commodities fell by an average of 71.6%. What that means is for the time it took you to buy one item in 1980, you get 3.52 items in 2018. That's a 252% increase in your personal abundance. Now, what that means is we were growing at about a 3.37% annual rate of growth. That doesn't seem like much, but it means that your abundance is doubling every 21 years. So every 21 years, I double. I go from one to two to four to eight every 20 years. Now, we also ran uh, linear regressions on all of these uh, different commodities. And what we found is the linear uh, rate of growth was about 6.37% a year. That was the average. Some, some commodities were much higher. Some were a bit lower than that. But that was the... Um, that was the slope that we, we found. Um, the regression uh, for your statisticians here, the R-square uh, was 0.895. 
And uh, we tested all these at a 95% confidence. Not a single one had actually been negative. They'd all been positive. So we were very, very pleased when we, we found that this underlying trend, yes, we have these temporary periods where things occur and prices go up and down, but this underlying trend that we, we saw was very clear. All of them were positive, without exception. All of them were positive over this period. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, back in the 1970s when Julian Simon had done his homework, he, he knew the data. He did the regressions. He, he knew how to do these regressions to, to discover these trends. That's why he was unafraid to bet on what the future was going to look like. Um, we, went, uh, we, we went back to 1960. Now, one of the issues is the further you go back in time, the thinner the data becomes, so it's a little more difficult. So we looked at 37 commodities from 1960 to 2018. We see the same kind of a pattern of this 3 to 4% growth every year. Now, uh, we also found ourselves a, uh, we got ourselves our hands on a 1979 Sears catalog. Some of you may remember what those look like. That used to be the Amazon of its day in 1979. Uh, so we pull this catalog out and we start comparing prices. We looked at 35 different products like toasters and dishwashers and clothing. Uh, and then we compared it to Walmart. Uh, what do you find if you go to walmart.com today and try to find the, you know, something's very same product does Walmart have that today? And what we found is that the average for blue collar workers, the time price had fallen by 71%. So they're getting 3.53 uh, times as much. You notice that the commodities have grown about 3.5 and uh, all of these consumer goods are also growing about 3.5 times, which is indicating this 3% a month or 3% a year. Then we uh, said, well, let's see if we can go back further. We went back to 1919, and we pull up uh, 42 different food items uh, for both blue collar and unskilled workers. Uh, and the average uh, price uh, decline was about 89.5%, the average time price decline, which means for the time it took you to buy one of these items in 1990, you get about 9.7, almost 10 of them today. So we're 10 times richer than uh, we were basically 100 years ago. Now on the top of that list, um, on the top of that list were eggs. Uh, so for the time it took you to work to buy one egg in 1919, how many eggs, uh, let's do a little quiz, how many eggs do you think you could get today if you're a blue collar worker? You get 36 eggs. You get three dozen eggs for the price of one. So, you know, even chickens are being innovative. It's like this innovation's happening all around us. We're able to discover these new ways to add knowledge. It's really what we're doing is we're adding knowledge to these atoms. We're making these atoms smarter. We're intelligizing atoms. Yes, we recognize that we live on this planet that's got a fixed number of atoms, but economics is not about atoms. Economics is about knowledge and the growth of knowledge. How we do we add value to the atoms around us? Yeah, that's kind of our key insight that we think. So when we go back to 18... 50, unskilled workers uh, today compared to 1850 have almost 28 times as much for the same amount of time. If you're a blue collar worker, you have about 58 times as much. So we've had this, this phenomenal increase. What we realize is things used to be really expensive. <laughs> they used to be really expensive. Um, so now let's talk about resources and population because this is really where uh, where this argument kind of goes back to uh, our, you know, is what's this relationship? Now, uh, Elon Musk, he raised eyebrows when he made these remarks about, uh, you know, we're, we're running out of people. And he, he talks about, uh, you know, smart people think that we're, we've got too many people. And he said, it's completely the opposite. He said, please look at the numbers. Uh, if people don't have more children, civilization is going to crumble. Mark my words. Well, we think this book is a great place to go to look at the numbers. Now to understand the difference between uh, the personal level and the population level, I want you to think about pizzas. Now the personal resource abundance is how large is your slice? And the population abundance is how large is the pie? Okay, how large is the pie? So we can calculate population level abundance by simply taking how many slices do we have Multiply that times how many people do you have, and that will tell you how large the pie is, okay? All right, so we can illustrate this with a little chart. 
So let's draw this chart, and we'll put population on the horizontal axis, and we'll put personal resource abundance on the vertical axis. And let's think about 1980. We'll set this to 1980, index uh, the population, uh, the population or the size of the pie in 1980. There's what it was. So it's a, this one by one box. Now let's draw another chart and do 2018. So we start at 2018 and two things happened, right? First of all, what happened to personal abundance? Well, when prices drop by 72%, personal abundance goes up by 252%. Instead of one, you get three, three and a half. But at the same time, you also had population increasing. Population increased about 70%. So you get that movement as well. So you see how we're growing from both dimensions? So the size of that box is about 6.02. So you went from one, 1980, let's overlay 1980 on uh, 2018, you go from that little red box to the green box. The difference there is that percentage change, about 500%. So on a global scale, we're experiencing this compounded annual growth rate of somewhere around almost what, four, four, almost 5%, which means every, what, 14 years, you get a double abundance. Once again, when we think about prices, if you've got a price here and you double population, but the price remains the same, what does that tell you about the abundance of that item? If you double population and the price is the same, doesn't that tell you that somebody's figured out how to accommodate all that additional population because the price is not going up. You've doubled abundance if the price remains the same. And what we observe is the price is actually going down in many cases, going down. So we get these two effects. All right, so the other interesting thing is when we look at that relationship between those two. So for every 1% increase in population, you and I, our personal abundance was growing about 3.5%. Every 1% growth in population on the planet, you and I got 3.5% richer. Now the whole planet got about 7% richer because we're getting bigger slices, but we're also getting lots more slices. There's more slices in this pie, 71% more slices. So <clears throat> we, we, uh, we, we saw that and it's like, wow, this is, this is pretty incredible. This is pretty incredible that as population goes up, resources are actually going up at a much faster rate. Three and a half times for individuals and seven times for the planet. So <clears throat> we look at other things. Let's take a look at 18, uh, there's our 1850. Oh, this is, uh, yeah, 1850. For these 26, we have, we, guy in Canada tracked uh, these 26 commodities. He goes clear back to 1850. So we got his data, got the nominal values, looked at nominal income in 1850, made the comparisons. And so this little dot here, that represents the size of the global pie in 1850. And remember, it grows in two dimensions. So population grew by 1,300%. Uh, and personal abundance, if you're a blue collar worker, grew by 5,700%. So you get this almost what? 83,000% increase. 83,000% increase in the size of the pie on the planet. So virtually everywhere we look with all of these products across countries, we observed that abundance was increasing faster than population was increasing. Now recall that we had this little chart here from 1980 to 2018. We went also, we had 42 different countries that we used in our analysis to come up with our overall global numbers. We went in and looked at each country and also looked at what the change happened in that individual country. If we want to zoom out, let's zoom out and uh, set that to a scale and compare it to China. So there's China, same little red box, the size of China's uh, pie, if you will, in, 20, in 1980. And how did China grow? Well, population grew by 43%, but their personal abundance grew by 3,900%. So the difference there is just phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, what, we would, what we would say about this is, is uh, every 1% increase in China's population corresponded to this 131% increase in their personal resource abundance. And uh, China's growing more people, but what were they really growing over this period? They were growing more freedom. They were giving people the freedom to be able to have some rights and markets. 
And part of what we uh, believe is this equation that we think about when we're thinking about this growth and prosperity, it's a function of population and freedom. When people are given freedom, suddenly they can lift themselves out of this poverty. Um, so <clears throat> we think that uh, we're much better off if we compare ourselves to who we were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. And time prices allow us to do that. Where were you 40 years ago? You have to be three to four times better off than you were 40 years ago. You really do. Now this obsession on income inequality is really at this kind of dead end. Um, because no matter how you compare yourself, how good you are, there's always somebody that's better. You always look like a loser, right? But if you compare yourself to yourself, or your grandparents or your great-grandparents, you're, you're always a winner, right? That perspective of comparison is really key to understanding how far we have come. We are much richer. Now, instead of income inequality, we like to think about time inequality. Now, Every one of us gets 24 hours in a, in a day, but how do you use your time? Now, Elon Musk is like a billion times richer than I am, but you know he doesn't have a billion times more hours in a day. You got the same time that you and I have. And no matter how rich you are, you cannot buy more time. 1960, a uh, person in India spent six to eight hours a day just working to earn the money to buy their food for that day. Today, it's less than an hour. So that person has got six more hours in a day to be able to do other things, to be creative, to learn, to pursue. It's got to be a, a, a great thing to consider how people are able to spend their 24 hours today and how much we are very much equal in terms of how we are able to do that. Yeah, we have a difference in income, but what is the time difference between you and I and other people on the earth in terms of what kind of time we have to devote to the things that are important to us. Do we have that choice today? Now recall that Julian Simon and Paul Ehrlich both agreed that, um, hang on, they both agreed that there was this relationship between population and resources, right? Now <clears throat> Ehrlich argued that as population increased, these resources become much more scarce. Uh, Julian, on the other hand, said, no, as population increases, these things would become much more abundant. Now, Ehrlich based his argument on Malthusian theory. Simon, on the other hand, based his argument on facts. And as Art Laffer has made this really interesting comment, he says, without data, any theory can be true. Right? Without data, any theory can be true. So what did we find when we went back and looked at our 18 data sets? Well, we found that they were all up here. Every one of them were up there. Resources were growing faster than population was growing. So uh, if you do find something down in that red zone, it's probably something that's being controlled by the government. The supply and or the demand is being controlled by government. And it's becoming maybe less and less abundant. But everything else seems to have this, this increasing abundancy. Now, we recognize that past performance does not guarantee future results, but past performance is pretty darn good. And we got this stack of data that says, look, we should be pretty confidence, confident in the future that when you increase population and freedom, you can expect this kind of flourishing of, of abundance. Now, uh, Alexandria said, is it okay to have children? Now, we answer that question with, Absolute yes, absolutely. There's never been a time on the planet. We don't want to hurt yeah, <laughs> we probably don't have to worry about it, Dad. But there's never been a time on the planet that has been more abundant to have children, to create children. So Julian Simon would say, each new person brings the potential to lift all of us with their unique gifts and talents if they are free to create and have free markets to share their creations. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share our story of population growth, innovation, and human flourishing on an infinitely bountiful planet. And I'm just, just profoundly grateful for all of my fellow human beings that have contributed these little bits of knowledge all over the place that have made our life what it is. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Gail. And the reason it's called superabundance is because the abundance in resources is increasing at a greater rate than the increase in population. Um, we, we now have time to hear from uh, David Simon, who has graciously uh, agreed to share a few words about his father, who is very much the pioneer, the inspiration of a lot of this uh, work. David Simon is a senior fellow at the Washington-based Committee to Unleash Prosperity, and he's a lawyer in Chicago. His father was, as I said, economist Julian Simon, uh, who did path-breaking work connecting the economics of population growth, immigration, natural resources, and the environment, and developed a market-based solution used by airlines to voluntarily resolve overbooking. So when when you're in the airport and uh, they call out, call out to not uh, to see if you want to change your uh, seat for another flight. The auction innovation that Julian Simon came up with, with his father, Mr. Simon co-authored articles concerning the economics of state liquor distribution systems and the effects of state regulations on liquor prices. Mr. Simon is a graduate of Johns Hopkins University and an honors graduate at the University of Wisconsin Law School. Please help me welcome David Simon. Thank you. To the memory of Simon Kuznets and Friedrich Hayek, and also for, young, for Milton Friedman, their younger colleague, that's the dedication to my father's book, The Economic Consequences of Immigration. Uh, I mention this because my father would have treasured Marion's and Gail's new book because it makes excellent contributions to economics of the kinds that led my father to admire uh, the Nobel Prize winners I just mentioned, Hayek, Friedman, and Kuznets. Like Hayek's work, superabundance shows the critical role of markets and spontaneous order in the evolution of societies and the horrendous failure of, particular, of a particular form of central economic planning, uh, government population planning, China being the most dramatic example. Like Friedman's work, superabundance shows through its empirical analysis of the, economic, of the connection between population growth and resource availability the importance of elevating empirical analysis over theory. In other words, it, uh, sort of something that Gail just said, the data matters. Kuznets made uh, crucial contributions to the development of national income measurement. He's the man who helped us figure out how to calculate gross domestic, gross domestic product, for example, and did important work on the early work on the uh, economics of population growth. Superabundance also has contributed to economic measurement, the Simon Abundance Index, time prices, time price multipliers, and price elasticities of population, all things they talk about in their book. Superabundance also reminded me of my father's somewhat tongue-in-cheek um, line about the difference between sociologists and economists. Sociologists, he would ask, uh, he would say, they would ask, does something matter? Economists, on the other hand, ask, how much does it matter? Superabundance answers many different aspects of this question in great detail, in great depth. Superabundance continues to vindicate my father's explanation of the central mechanism of human progress. In the short run, all resources are limited, natural resources, human resources. In the short run, a greater use of any resource means pressure on supplies and a higher price in the market, or even rationing. That's uh, from my father's book, The Ultimate Resource Two. The longer run is a very different story than the shorter run. The standard of living has, been, has risen along with the size of the world's population since the beginning of recorded time. And with the increases in income and population have come less severe shortages, lower costs, and increased availability of resources. There's no physical or economic reason, he wrote, why human resources and enterprise cannot forever continue to respond to impending shortages and existing problems with new expedients 
that after an adjustment period leave us better off than before the problem arose. Adding more people will cause us more problems, but at the same time, there will be more people to solve these problems and leave us with a bonus of lower costs and less scarcity in the long run. In other words, we become better off than we were before the problem existed. Superabundance also emphasizes three more big points of my father's work. Number one, there is only one important resource which has shown a trend of increased scarcity rather than increasing abundance. The resource is the most important of all, human beings. There are more people on Earth now than ever before, but if we measure the scarcity of people the same way that we measure the scarcity um, of other economic goods, how much we must pay to obtain their services. We see that wages and salaries have been going up all over the world in poor countries as well as rich countries. Number two, the main fuel to our speed of progress, he wrote, is our stock of knowledge and the break is our lack of imagination. The ultimate resource is people, skilled, spirited, and hopeful people who will exert their wills and imaginations for their own benefit and inevitably they will benefit not only themselves, but the rest of us. Number three, even talented and energetic people required an incentive to create better techniques and organizations and protection for property uh, that is the fruit of their labors. Therefore, the political economic structure is the crucial determinant of the speed with which economic development occurs in the presence of economic liberty and respect for property, population growth causes fewer problems in the short run and greater benefits in the long run than where the state controls economic activity. My father's work and superabundance rebut the population bomb and the limits to growth hysteria uh, and resulting policies from those, from those uh, abhorrent uh, books and, and theories. They were based, they, they, those, those were based on unfounded models. They were contrary to the data and they caused so much harm to human freedom and abundance. Today, global warming and, and climate change hysteria policies like Joe Biden's and John Kerry's policies to end fossil fuel production and use similarly are based on unfounded models, are contrary to the data, and are causing harm to human freedom and abundance. Two recent examples. The agricultural catastrophe in Sri Lanka this year, which resulted from policies like banning chemical fertilizers that supposedly will slow global warming. That's one. Number two, the recent power outages in California and in Texas, resulting from policies to reduce and, uh, production and use of fossil fuel. The data show that global warming has not been harmful and on balance instead has been beneficial by, for example, saving millions of lives in recent decades. For those interested in my short articles on this topic, a page and a half, two pages, that, that continue my father's work, uh, please see my website, www.d as in David, m as in Max, s as in Simon, writings.com. Thank you, Barian. Thank you, Gail. Thank you to the Cato Institute for giving us superabundance. Thanks very much. We now have time for questions, uh, both on, we'll be taking them both online and in person. Um, the online audience may join uh, the conversation and submit questions directly via the event webpage, Facebook, YouTube, and on Twitter using the hashtag Cato events. When, uh, when I call on you, uh, uh, first of all, please raise your hand and then uh, please identify yourself and your affiliation and then ask the question. We'll take the first question Right here, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Octavian Dragomir Jora. I'm a professor of economics at the Bucharest University of Economic Studies in Romania. I'm a founder and editor in chief of the Market for Ideas magazine, and I'm thrilled to be here. Three quick shots. First, you said that this book is about uh, rational optimism. But I was hysterically scared when I read its title because I'm an economist. Like all economists, I'm involved in scarcity business and uh, superabundance 
sounds dramatic, it could as, uh, have left all the economists in the world jobless. <laughs> I can't afford to think of such an uh, outcome. Second, uh, please help me uh, answer an uh, eventual question of one of my students related to the glorious revolution, but not the glorious revolution, the glorious fourth industrial revolution. Uh, it's a revolution that implies uh, increasing returns on the software sites, but the high pressure on resources on the hardware sites. Uh, the side of uh, semiconductors, the rare earths, and so on. Uh, we had a recent uh, chip crisis, and it seems not to match with the optimism, even if it, it is rational in this book. How can we reconcile the software optimism of the fourth industrial revolution with the scary movie on the hardware side? Uh, and the third quick shot, uh, it's worth uh, uh, being here and traveling a quarter of the world from Bucharest, Romania to see such a great event. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, the real question, it seems to me, is about rare earths and what do we have to say about things like that? I'll, I'll take the first shot out. Use your microphone. Please. Okay, so the, uh, the question of scarcity, I think we got off on... Uh, Use the microphone. We got off on the issue of we good? Uh, this this idea this I call it the ideology of scarcity has been the most harmful virus we've had in humanity. This idea that we have a fixed number of atoms and we've got to fight over these atoms. Uh, it's been very very harmful. When we recognize that it's not atoms that we value, it's the arrangement of those atoms. And when we add knowledge to atoms, that's what makes them valuable. And so that's how it, I, I'm hoping, yeah, we, we get up first day in class in econ and say, you know, it's the study of choice under scarcity. It's really about the study of how human beings create value for one another when they discover and share knowledge in markets. That's what economics really studies. Moving from counting atoms to thinking about the price of things. The price, follow the price, it will tell you much more than the quantity. And it will also lead to incentives that allow people to focus very heavily in trying to find a substitute, trying to find more supply. You notice we have these crises. It's a crisis of the shortage. Uh, anybody have any trouble getting toilet paper today? Well, a year and a half ago, it was a crisis of toilet paper. What happened? People stopped going to the bathroom? What happened? Yeah, the market responded to that. You know, be a little bit patient, and these things will, will pass if people are free to be able to pursue this new knowledge that allows us to lift one another. That's what I'd say about scarcity. Now, uh, kind of related to this rare earth thing, right, when the price goes up, what does that tell you to do? One, stop using it. Two, go find some more of it. Three, find a substitute. And four, recycle. When those things happen, Julian always said this, you're going to have this period that's going to go like this, but after you, those four things kick in, that price is going to come back down. You're actually going to be better off than where you started. This crisis will actually lead to, to being in a position that's better off because you will then have had the incentives to create the new knowledge necessary to make these atoms even more abundant. My favorite example of um, subsidy or um, when you exchange uh, one commodity that you're using for another is, uh, has to do with electric vehicles. Right now, um, you know, the world is, seems to be moving toward more electric vehicles which need batteries. Batteries are powered by lithium ion batteries. Therefore, we can project how many cars, electric vehicle cars, we are going to be selling, how much lithium we know of, and therefore Armageddon 10 years down the road, right? Except that scientists have already discovered that sodium ion may be even better than lithium ion in order to power these batteries, and sodium is just salt. And who knows what other discoveries we are going to discover in the periodic table, which has 100 uh, different atoms, which have 100 different um, items in it. And just calculating the different combinations could take eternity. Uh, once you start thinking about two calculations, um, um, you, you're talking about 
10,000 calculations. Uh, sorry, two, uh, two, two items. You, you're talking about 10,000 calculations. When you get to 10 um, item compounds, there are more calculations, possible calculations, than the number of seconds is the Big Bang. So, as Paul Romer says, th there's simply not enough people or enough time that has expired for us to even scratch the surface of the kinds of knowledge that humanity can discover in order to get around the problem of scarcity. We'll take a question right here. Thank you, I'm Max Pappas with Google, and a long time fan of human progress. I'm glad to see this come together in a book. So one of the, the three variables that you have is uh, knowledge. And there are dramatic advances being made in artificial intelligence, uh, which is, of course, a human creation. I'm wondering if you've thought in a look forward what that might mean for the potential of even more abundance. Yes, so the, the, the book is based on the assumption that, um, that right now the only entity capable of producing new idea is the human brain. It is possible that sometime down the road, AI could potentially start coming up with its own ideas, but we are not there. We don't know if we'll if we'll get there. Um, my hope is that um, if uh, that if AI eventually arrives, it will complement uh, humans, will speed up the process of calculation and problem solving. Um, that, that would be the best of both worlds. But right now, um, uh, and looking for looking toward the immediate future. Um, the problem is not that we don't have AI yet to come up with new ideas. The, the, the big problem we are facing is that a lot of people are simply freaked out about the future. And uh, in the concluding chapters of the book, we have number of, we point to a number of studies where parents say we cannot bring uh, children into the world that is on fire, the world that is going to end. Um, and uh, that is a problem because no people, no civilization, no future. Uh, thanks, uh, Marion. Uh, actually, Nick Gillespie sends in this uh, question online. What are the biggest intellectual and emotional stumbling blocks in getting people, especially those under 40 who seem preoccupied with climate change as an existential threat, to seriously contemplate and hopefully embrace the idea that we are in a world of superabundance? What are the biggest intellectual and emo emotional stumbling blocks uh, that you see? Well, I think that Gail has already pointed to the, 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 the mental block where you perceive the finality of a finite nature of the atoms in the world. And it's very difficult for the brain to think, but, but out of it you can create infinite value. Right? How, how can you create infinite value out of something that is finite? And my answer to that would be the great quote from Thomas Sowell. The Stone Age man had exactly the same amount of resources that we have in the world today. And the difference between his standard of living and our standard of living is the knowledge that we can bring to those same resources. And as I said a short while ago, that knowledge is minuscule compared to what is awaiting humanity, provided that we have human brains and perhaps even AI functioning together, cooperating in order to create new knowledge. Yeah, I would just add to that, uh, you're all in this room, and there's a reason that you, you made the choice to come here. I think that you see something that the general public doesn't see. Uh, and where we've maybe failed in the last uh, couple of decades is being able to articulate that vision to, to these younger people about what we see and what we've seen and what we see potentially going forward into the future. They've been told lots of things that, uh, by people who profit from this fear. And uh, so we've got this, we've got all these facts on the table, but we've got to take these facts and tie them to ideas that are compelling and persuasive. That's, that's what we've got to be able to do now. It happened, Ian and I were talking about free to choose this. If you remember Milton Friedman in this series, it's like that was very, very persuasive. And it persuaded me when I was 21. 
wow, this is a, uh, you know, it was very good. We don't seem to have that today that we can use to put on the table and say, you need to be countering what you're hearing with this. So hopefully, you know, we can, we can do something on that order. I want to say one more thing on this subject, and that is that even though young people, uh, old people, uh, are constantly surrounded by technological change, um, and often we complain about the speed of technological change, when it comes to solving our problems that still remain, somehow human brain simply considers technology to be static. We do not understand that technology is actually dynamic. So if you are using product X or um, um, you know, food item or a mineral, we simply assume that we are going to be using it until we run out of it and then, then it's all over. But, the, the, but once you understand that there is this technological, that technology is dynamic, you will understand that there are all sorts of ways in which you can get around the problems of scarcity provided you are free to innovate. And this is very important, that we shouldn't be prevented from innovating by precautionary principle and other government idiocies. We have a question on this side. We'll take it from this gentleman. Hi, Ian. Dan Martinez, uh, uh, formerly with the State Department, now with a law firm in Texas, Houston, Texas. Um, so um, I spent 20 plus years uh, promoting U.S. commercial competitiveness uh, in the global economy, uh, trade investment area. And I guess my question is, how does globalization, global trade investment factor in to your, your um, analysis? And specifically re with regard to China and, you know, this trade war, trade uh, differences that we have with China, how does that factor in? If, if, if we begin a process of de-accelerating de globalization, how, does, how, does this, how do you see that playing out? Well, what I would say is, back to this definition, wealth is knowledge. And anything you do to prevent the creation of knowledge, by definition, is going to prevent the creation of new wealth. Now, when we limit our ability to have communication with anybody else on the planet, we are effectively limiting our ability to discover new knowledge and share that knowledge. Uh, so I would say that in general, you know, the specific details with countries, uh, we know that we have other issues besides economic growth that we're concerned about, the political, the military, those issues. But fundamentally, when you've got 1.2, 1.3 billion Chinese that have this small measure of freedom and rights, look at what they've been able to accomplish that's really blessed the rest of us. Our lives over the last 40 years have become immensely better because of Chinese entrepreneurship and China's freedom to be able to innovate and share their innovations with us. Do we want to have that thing to continue? I think we do. And then in terms of the ability that we have to share these ideas across the planet, when everybody's got a smartphone, everybody's connected to the internet, everybody is able to tap into the existing knowledge and add and grow to that, that's also got to be phenomenally positive for this forward ability to now discover and grow knowledge. So this potential is, is really infinite. The question is, are we going to be able to politically be able to manage that in such a way where we treat people with this dignity and respect that we should all have here on this planet because we don't know who is going to be able to be that next contributor. Who is the next Steve Jobs? Where is he or she or they? And so it really leads us to this idea of we've really got to advance this idea of human freedom. If we want prosperity, Human beings have to have freedom all over the planet. That point is incredibly important, and uh, uh, it highlights the fact that the diminishment of freedom anywhere in the world is a diminishment of your own freedom. Because if we can't actually interact with, by the market or exchanging ideas with people in another part of the world, our own freedoms have been reduced, not to mention the human progress that comes out of that interaction. So that's a key, I think, to understanding uh, the Superabundance book. 
the ver at, at, ba at bottom, this is an idea where dignity and respect of the individual is taken seriously. Let's take uh, a question here. Uh, thank you. My name is Mark Sherman. I'm in wealth management. I have a quick follow-up, though, with respect to China. I understand we're adding all these people. There's markets. There's creativity. But how does it play out with the intellectual property? And one of the slides specifically talked about having this shared political economic environment where people could flourish. Doesn't that diminish some of that in some ways as well, if, if everyone's not playing by the same rules, so to speak, globally? David, David's the lawyer. <laughs> All I would say is if you go back and look at what we did in the, U in the U.S. in the 1800s, we were over in the U.K. stealing all their stuff. Um, yeah, intellectual property is very key to incentivize individuals to be able to go out and create wealth. But uh, sometimes I think we, we get so obsessed with that that we're really preventing this creation of new knowledge. Is it worth the trade-off to be able to do this? And... What we notice is that countries come along when they reach a certain level of prosperity, they begin to respect those kinds of rights. Well, what are we going to do? Are we going to expect people to, to remain in these conditions, or are we going to give them some opportunities to grow out of those conditions by using our intellectual property and then uh, hope, uh, based on history, that they're going to mature as well in this respect of this particular kind of a property right. We have a question over here. Kevin, I'm concerned about the AI that China is using to uh, repress the people there. I don't think they have that much freedom. So uh, how do you prevent the science from being used against the people like in China? And I like your um, counterpoint. I'd like to see Musk and uh, Ocasio-Cortez uh, debate that would be <laughs> nice and, and I'd, I'd like uh, C-SPAN to uh, put people like um, Michael Hudson uh, the Destiny of Civilization on their uh, book TV that would so you get a different point of view okay thanks um. Just to be clear, when we talk about freedom in China, we are, of course, talking about the period after 1978 when China started to liberalize. Uh, nothing we say should sort of be, be read to, uh, to, to, to think that we consider China to be a free country. It is not. And in fact, it's been becoming less free after 2012. Um, in terms of technological development, any technology can be used for good and evil. Pretty much all technologies could be used for good and evil. Um, where you stop, um, or where you should stop, that, that is obviously a, a conversation that is being had by people much smarter than me. Um, let's assume that we were to decide as a, as a society that we should stop right now in terms of development of AI, and because AI could turn us all into paper clips. Well, okay, what if there is a new pathogen coming down the road that could wipe out humanity and could be resolved um, through further technological advance, including AI? Um, what if there is an asteroid that we need to take care of and, uh, and AI could help? Um, you know, stasis, if there is no technological progress, uh, progress and new problems arise that we are not prepared for, um, then that carries with it a lot of cost as well. So that needs to be taken into account. We have time for at least one more question. I want to take one online from an anonymous uh, uh, audience member who, who writes, um, do statistical representations of productivity, product, and resource availability take into account global inequity in the distribution of wealth and access? Agglomeration of measurements tend to discount the poor and disadvantage. I think that uh, Gail Pooley talked a little bit about that in his presentation, but what about uh, what you have to say with respect to superabundance and inequality? Yeah, I think our first data set that we looked at, these 50 basic commodities, you know, if you're poor, you're spending a much higher proportion of your income on those basic food items. So if you see innovation occur there, the poor are the primary beneficiaries of this innovation that's happening. If you go from spending seven hours a day to an hour a day, to just to be able to feed yourself, that is phenomenal progress. And uh, the, the, once again, the inequity uh, w with income, I think it's, we go down that road and it's a dead end. 
because we're always going to have this income in inequity. The question is, what do you get to do with your next 24 hours of your life? That seems to me to be a much more important question. And what we see there is people are much more equal, becoming much more equal to one another in terms of the amount of time that we have to devote to these levels in the Maslow hierarchy that are above this physiological level. If you're not hungry, you can do lots of things. And fewer and fewer, we still have great hunger on this planet, no question about it, but fewer and fewer of us are facing this kind of hunger. Uh, and, and that has these two benefits of being able to now give people this time that they need during the day to do other things, to learn, to grow, to be able to discover, to, to be able to create. And that ability to do that makes us all really much more, more equal. Once again, Elon Musk has a billion times more uh, net worth than, than you and I, but does he really have a billion times more hours in a day? No, he doesn't. The time that he devotes to his efforts during the day is really not that much different than the time you and I do, really. So that's what I'd, I'd note on that one. We have time for one last very quick question and quick answer, and we'll take it uh, right here in the back. I'm Michael Savota, George Washington University. Uh, I'm surprised there was no citation to Bjorn Lomborg in your book. Bjorn Lomborg? Yeah. That there are many people that we didn't uh, include in, in the book. Um, Bjorn is one of them. I mean, I, I'm a big fan. I follow his work. Um, it's just that uh, we've been working uh, on natural resources on which uh, I'm not aware Bjorn has written extensively. By his book. <laughs> with our book. Yep, he's a great guy, and he's spoken here uh, on, on several occasions. Yep. Right. So we recognize his contributions, his early contributions, the uh, Skeptical, Skeptical Environmentalist, what was his first book? Great book that, once again, used facts to be able to challenge the theory at the time. And I think it's also very important when Thomas Sowell is asked, how come you... Uh, you became, a, you know, you're a Marxist and you, you studied under Milton Friedman and you were a Marxist. What changed your mind? And he said, facts. Facts. So facts can be difficult because there's not the emotion associated with facts that sometimes uh, those folks on the other side are able to use. But I think it's key that we able to put these facts on the table and say, look, at this perspective. This is the way you need to think about your life. Bjorn's done a great, uh, Bjorn's done a great job with that. We hope that our book makes a similar contribution. Yeah, we hope that this book, uh, we hope that this book will uh, provide the, the facts and the arguments to help uh, change people's minds, and contribute to this debate in an important way. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And I especially want to thank uh, Larry Summers, the authors of our book, and David Simon for joining us. It's been uh, a great event, and uh, I encourage all of you again to, to buy this book. Those of you who are here, we will be having a little reception in the Winter Garden on the first floor. Thank you again to everybody.